let me begin by saying that uh, this talk is divided into five sections. And so at each point, and as I'm going through the talk, when I come to a new section, I will let you know that we're switching gears a little bit to discuss something else. This talk is also predicated on something that you've all, we've all seen uh, several times this session, the seven principles uh, of the human being. And there were some nice charts about it and so forth. So uh, that's the, the predicate of, of this talk. Um, so let's begin. Uh, we're going to take a deep dive into the writings of HPB and the Mahatmas Maurya and Kutumi. Uh, those are the, principally the three sources that I've used to come up with this uh, answer to this question. <coughs> so, the purpose of this presentation is to answer the question posed in the title. Precisely what of human beings reincarnates? The answer to be sought is first, a description that is as clear and succinct as possible given the enormous scope and difficult context of the subject. And second, an answer that could, be f that could further serve as a definition. In order to arrive at such an answer, however, we must acknowledge that the nature and composition of the reincarnating entity, which I will call the transmigrant, is inseparable from the process of the transition of the reincarnating entity from the point of death through the postmortem states to the point of rebirth in a new terrestrial corporeal existence. And when I say the word transmigrant, you may be more familiar with spiritual monad or spiritual ego. It doesn't matter, but I'm, I prefer transmigrant. So that's the term I'll use here. Two principal divisions of the subject are, first, the entire composition of the decedent, the person who's died, at the point of death, including his or her inner transmigrant as it undergoes change within its transition through the postmortem states. And second, the process and course of its transition through the postmortem states. These two features are inextricable, not unlike the dancer and the dance. In addition to these two principal divisions, we, we must also examine the method employed to arrive at our answer. This method will be further clarified in what follows, but briefly, it is that of spiritual science, drawn largely from the writings of H.P. Blavatsky and two of her teachers, the adepts Moria and Kutumi. This spiritual scientific method relies on recorded observations of spiritually advanced and trained beings who are able to perceive within the subtle modalities of nature, the multiple states of being. Accordingly, a good place to begin this inquiry is by considering nearly the same question that was posed by HPB herself. In 1884, HPB asked, <coughs> and answered the following question, quote, now, what is it that incarnates? The occult doctrine, so far as it is given out, shows that the first three principles die more or less with what is called the physical death, the, the first three of the seven principles. The fourth principle, together with the lower portions of the fifth, in which reside the animal propensities, has Kamaloka for its abode, where it suffers the throes of disintegration in proportion to the intensity of those lower desires. While it is the higher manas, the pure man, which is associated with the sixth and seventh principles, that goes into Devashan to enjoy there the effects of its good karma, and then to be reincarnated as a higher individuality." End quote. So that was HPB's question and answer to the same question and answer that we're considering here today. The question our, our title asks is precisely what is it that reincarnates? It is the cumulative esoteric or theosophic data of spiritual science and knowledge derived therefrom that comprises what will fill in 
The interstices, or the gaps, of HPV's answer that I read here, examined more fully in what follows. Second segment of the, of the paper, the spiritual science method. There are two significant ways to describe esoterically the process of death and transition through the post-mortem states to rebirth, and one can fairly claim that both are correct. Stated alternatively, neither of these two ways or methods should be viewed as the antithesis of the other, since these two approaches are fundamentally complementary and not contrary. The first of these methods, the exegetic method from the word, English word exegesis, which is the interpretation of scripture, um, need not detain us at this point. But briefly, the exegetic, the exegetic method affected through exegesis, principally of Western sacred scripture, relies on one's intuitive ability to plummet the depths of scripture through exegesis to the core of its meaning. It also tends to focus upon general philosophical concepts of paradise, hell, and purgatory, at least as applied to our subject here, that appear in the scriptures. This hermeneutic also avoids any detailed esoteric or spiritual science explanations of the seven human principles, such as found in the Sanskrit term kosas, and their transition through the postmortem states to rebirth, and any discussion of the ro role of karma in the process. The second significant method to comprehend the transmigrant and the process of death and transition through the postmortem states to rebirth is what we can call be called that of spiritual science, or perhaps the occult sciences, which often focuses on the specifics, the detailed processes involved. This is the method used in this presentation. This is because no thorough or detailed understanding of the transmigrant or of reincarnation can be had without first having a clear or scientific understanding of the seven principles of the human being. Spiritual science also includes, in addition to the doctrine of transmigration and the postmortem states, other domains of spiritual or psychic development that pertain to the detailed functioning of the primary nerve plexes or chakras, the ancient methods known as kundalini yoga and pranayama, and generally the development and use of the siddhis or powers which include clairvoyance, clairaudience, telekinesis, <coughs> among, among others. As to the description of transmigration and the postmortem states, together with, the, with this other occult phenomena, through the spiritual scientific method, we are fortunate to be able to borrow an existing vocabulary in Sanskrit to use in seeking to describe and understand these universal eschatological phenomena. This same vocabulary was used extensively by HPB and her teachers, Moria and Kutumi. There is, moreover, a corresponding Tibetan vocabulary, including terms that apply to certain Vajrayana Buddhist processes of death and transition through the postmortem states, or bardos, to liberation or to rebirth, which appear in the complete Tibetan Book of the Dead. The higher, subtler, principles of the human being can best be understood by reference to Sanskrit terms in the Vedantic formulation of the five or pancha constituent kosas, or bodies, translated bodies, alternatively translated as sheaths or vehicles or envelopes, as found in the Taitriya Upanishad. We, we can add to these translations the word principles for the three higher kosas, principles being HPB and the adept's term of choice, referred to as the higher triad, the highest three kosas or principles are the Anandamaya kosa, which also may be termed the Atma, 
The Vijnanaya Maya Kosa, which also may be termed the Buddhi, and the Manomaya Kosa, often termed the Manas. The Vedantic Atma Buddhi Manas Kosas align exactly with the three higher principles used by HPB, Moria, and Kutumi. And these writers consistently follow the order in their writings that the Atma, Buddhi, and Manas are the seventh, sixth, and fifth principles, or kosas. In succinctly summarizing this doctrine of principles, Moria stated that, quote, man has his seven principles, the germs of which he brings with him at his birth, end quote. The lower quaternary, or the lower four of these seven principles, does not as easily lend itself to comparisons with either of the Vedantic concepts of kosa, described above, or to sharia, also translated as body. The Katha Upanishad identifies three sharidas, only two of which are used in the theosophic designation of the seven principles. The slula sharida, the gross physical body of the first and first of the septenary principles, and the linga sharia, a subtle counterpart of the physical body composed of energy known as akasa, being the second. The third principle, composed of fohat energy according to the Mahat Memoria, is consistently referred to as jivatma, or life principle, by the 19th century theosophical writers. Similarly, the fourth lower principle is referred to as kamarupa, and is the center of desire, emotion, and volition. Thus, during the incarnate life of each human being, the seven principles, lower quaternary and higher triad, operate as a cohesive unit until death. After death, the denser lower principles usually undergo rapid dissolution, while the fourth and the fifth principles usually undergo a gradual sublimation based on karmic factors. The seventh principle remains unchanged, while the sixth principle, buddhi, is said to assimilate essential portions of the fifth principle. It may seem that the adepts and HPB arbitrarily borrowed Sanskrit terms from an extant systematic Vedantic doctrines in order to arrive at a terminology of their own to describe the septenary principles of human beings. But while those early Vedantic systems of kosha and sharida were memorialized in writing and described other composite features of human beings, no such discrete or existing system of Asian origin appears to convey the facts of the septenary organization HPB and the adepts used th throughout their writings. These writers thus relied on applicable Sanskrit terms and did their best to translate them into intelligible English. One last and crucial observation about these principles needs highlighting, which is that the fifth principle, manas, or mind, is bifurcated between the lower mind, the seat of ordinary thought, and the higher mind, the seat of abstract and or spiritual thought. In esoteric literature, these two aspects of manas, sometimes referred to as rupa, lower, and arupa, higher, or form and formless, sometimes translated, are separated by a subtle divide known as the antakarana. For our purposes, it is necessary to understand that for most decedents, during the post-mortem journey, the manas arupa, the higher mind, or in any event the highest portions of it, joins the sixth and seventh principles, buddhi and atma. Together, these two highest principles, joined by some sublimated or higher portions of the fourth and fifth, form the transmigrant, the surviving element of the human being that reincarnates. Now we're entering to another segment of the, of the talk. This one's titled Atma and its vehicle Buddhi. Yet another key component to understanding precisely what it is that reincarnates is understanding clearly the relationship between the seventh 
and sixth principles, or Atma and Buddhi. While these principles may be key to a clear understanding, they are also the most difficult to describe, owing largely to the fact that Atma is infinite, unconditioned, and eternal, and therefore not subject to any contraries or to any limitations that may be ascribed to it by language or even by thought. This fact then brings us to the edge of mystery, where the faculty of reason is surpassed and the intuition that operates in human beings by and through the buddhi can provide the only genuine understanding. Even though the atma and buddhi are often treated as and seen to perform as a single unit in theosophic discussions of reincarnation, they are in fact two discrete and separate principles and for this reason need to be discussed separately. So now our discussion is we'll focus on the, uh, discussing the Atma. I'll start with a quote. Quote, we include Atma among the human principles, wrote HPB, in order not to create additional confusion. In reality, it is no human, but the universal absolute principle of which Buddhi, the soul spirit, is the carrier, end quote. This permanent, immortal, <coughs> non-human designation applies only to the Atma among the seven principles. All the rest are impermanent. Quoting the Parinavana Sutra, Kutumi states that, quote, it is only when all outward appearances are gone and that there is left that one principle of life, Atma, which exists independently of all external phenomena. It is the fire that burns in the eternal light when the fuel is expended and the flame is extinguished. For that fire is neither in the flame nor in the fuel, nor yet inside either of the two, but above, beneath, and everywhere." End quote. He adds, and this is crucial here, he adds that, neither Atma nor Buddhi were ever within man, end quote. Let me repeat that. Neither Atma nor Buddhi were ever within man, end quote. We'll get back to that point. Further descriptions of the Atma by HPB allow us only to add more adjectives and similes to that which, in actuality, can support no comparisons. Nonetheless, to give the reader a flavor of the difficulty in attempting to provide any description of Atma, we quote further from HPB. And here's a series of quotes from her. One, the seventh principle is the synthesis of the sixth and not a principle but a ray of the absolute all in strict truth. Here's another. Atma is nothing. It is all absolute. And it cannot be said that it is this, that, or the other. It is simply that in which we are." End quote. Here's another. The higher self is Atma, the inseparable ray of the universal one self. It is the God above more than within us. End quote. So those are HPBs, a few of them put together here to describe Atma which is fundamentally, as I said, indescribable. So we'll turn our attention now to the buddhi. Whatever else may be the attributes and functions of the sixth principle, in its passive condition, the buddhi is, above all, in HPV's words, the vehicle, her word, the carrier, again her word, and even the casket of the atma or seventh principle. We say passive condition because buddhi is said to have both a passive and active condition. This is explained by Kutumi in his observation that, quote, the supreme energy resides in the buddhi, latent passive, when wedded to atma alone, active and irresistible, and when galvanized by the essence of manas, and when none of the dross of the latter commingles with that pure essence to weigh it down, 
by its infinite nature, end quote. HPB adds that, quote, it is buddhi considered as an active instead of a passive principle, which it is generally when regarded only as the vehicle or casket of the supreme spirit atma. It is an electro-spiritual force, a creative power, which when aroused into action can as easily kill as it can create, end quote. And because buddhi has this dual active passive aspect and can, be, and can be galvanized by the essence of the fifth principle, manas, it is mutable and thus ultimately impermanent, unlike atma. This conclusion is supported by HBB who wrote that, quote, the sixth principle in man, buddhi, the divine soul, though a mere breath in our conceptions, is still something material when compared with divine spirit, atma, of which, is, of which it is the carrier or vehicle, end quote. Before leaving the discussion of atman buddhi and the unique relationship between these two principles, it is important to be aware that there are two different points of view within esoteric metaphysics that date back into antiquity. The first such viewpoint is that, that of the adepts in HPB and others which holds that the sixth and seventh principles, Atman Buddhi, are technically not integrated with the other five principles of the human beings, or if you wish, skandhas, but are only spiritually linked to them and, quote, overshadow them. This explains Kutumi's quote ab above that neither Atman nor Buddhi were ever within man. HPB explains in more detail, quote, the spirit, Atma, never descends hypostatically into the living man, but only showers, more or less, its radiance on the inner man, the psychic and spiritual compound of the, of the astral principles, end quote. As a matter of logical necessity, because the buddhi is the vehicle or casket of the atma, and the atma never descends hypostatically into the living man, then the buddhi as well cannot be understood to be part of the living man or person, or integrated hypostatically within the five lower principles. Concluding this thought, HPB elsewhere explains of the atma, of the atma and so necessarily of the buddhi, that, quote, it only overshadows the mortal, that which enters into him and pervades the whole body, being only its omnipresent rays or light radiated through buddhi, its vehicle and direct emanation, end quote. The alternative to this view is that of the Kabbalists, referring to the, he the Hebrew neshama of the Zohar, HBB stated that Kabbalists, quote, maintain that the human spirit, detaching itself from the ocean of light and universal spirit, enters man's soul, where it remains throughout life imprisoned in the astral capsule, end quote. This difference of opinion can essentially be reduced to the question of whether a portion of the immortal spirit, atma or neshama, being unconditioned and omnipresent, can in fact detach from the ocean of life and universal spirit of which it is a part. Can the atma, in other words, become differentiated and effectively isolated as a divisible piece of this ocean and reside within a human being, cooperating with his or her other principles during multiple rebirths? Or for the transmigrant's entire journey from individuation from the animal kingdom to liberation, that would be nirvana or moksha. We believe the ultimate answers to these questions and the final resolution of this debate are not as important as acknowledging a more significant realization about the atma that relates to them. This is that, notwithstanding the unconditioned and omnipresent nature of the atma, there is an enigmatic individuality about it that is core to the nature of the transmigrant as a whole, 
which also includes the buddhi and the sublimated essences it has assimilated from prior incarnations. Based on what has been said of the atma, this assertion sounds almost like a contradiction in terms, if not a fallacy. Yet HPB boldly addressed this super-rational, if not mystic, concept by venturing to say that, quote, though merged entirely into parabrahm, man's spirit, atma, while not individual per se, yet perseveres its distinct individuality in paranirvana, end quote. Profound and inscrutable as it may sound, this concept of the preservation of a distinct individuality is the only one that explains the ability of the adepts and certain others to recollect at will the entirety of all their past incarnations on earth. HBB further explains this mystery by noting that, quote, the most spiritual, that is the highest and divinest, aspirations of every personality follow buddhi and the seventh principle, atma, into devashan, svarga, after the death of each personality along the line of rebirths and become part and parcel of the monad, end quote, or as I would say, the transmigrant. So now we come to another section of the presentation, which is spiritual spoil and synthesis of principles. At this juncture, it will be useful to review the lowest and highest of the principles as they transition the post-mortem states following death. The three lowest principles, shlula sariya, or the gross physical body, linga sharia, the subtle counterpart, of the physical, sometimes refers, referred to as the akasic or etheric body, and jivatma, or the life principle, all die at the time of death or soon thereafter. The two highest principles, the atman buddhi, are effectively unfazed by death. This is because they are respectively immortal and quasi-immortal. As such, the final point of liberation from the wheel of death and rebirth the buddhi ceases its journey while the distinct individuality of the overshadowing atma no longer serves any purpose and all that remains is undifferentiated atma in parabrahm, quote, the ocean of life in the universal spirit, end quote. Beyond the fates of the first, second, and third mortal principles, the destinies of the sixth principle and the immortal seventh principle it only remains to follow the varying outcomes for the fourth and fifth principles in the post-mortem states. Once the lowest three principles have died and thus have separated from the remaining higher four principles, the fourth and fifth principles then, coexisting, then coexist temporarily with the sixth and seventh principles in the Kamaloka until a struggle occurs between them. For understanding this interactive struggle, we refer to Kutumi's description of it. This is a long quote, so it begins here. Thenceforth, it is a death struggle between the upper and lower principles or dualities, okay? That is, the, the fourth and the fifth are entered into a death struggle with the sixth and the seventh. If the upper duality wins, the sixth principle, having attracted to itself the quintessence of good from the fifth, its nobler affections, its saintly, though they be earthly aspirations, and the most spiritualized portions of its mind, follow its divine elder, the seventh, into, gestation, into the gestation state, and the fifth and fourth remain in association as an empty shell there in, in the Kamaloka. That's the end of the quote. Like the first through third principles that all die together at death, the fourth and fifth principles, having lost this struggle, this karmic struggle with the sixth and the seventh principles, and thus temporarily existing as a shell, will also gradually dissolve 
in the postmortem states. But this dissolution does not occur before the manas, or fifth principle, renders to the buddhi, the sixth principle, those sublimated essences or spiritual spoil of the fifth principle that will then follow or merge, those two terms are, those are terms used by the writers, follow or merge with the buddhi and will thereby become absorbed by the reincarnating entity, the transmigrant. This post-mortem phenomenon of the merging or assimilation of these sublimated essences into the buddhi and becoming part of the transmigrant is one, unfortunately, about which comparatively little is written by HPB or the adepts. Consequently, our understanding of this process, this merging, can only be partial unless we have earned the ability to make our own investigations in the, in, to the question. And let me confess now, I have not been able to do that. Um, KH refers to that which follows the sixth principle, buddhi, into devashan and rebirth as the quintessence of the good from the fifth as its, quote, nobler affections, its saintly aspirations, its spiritual spoil, and its most spiritualized portions. So keep in mind, we're not talking about the merging of the entire manas. We're not even talking about the entire, the merging of the entire upper or manasarupa into the six. We're only talking, talking about these um, essences that, that flow out of the fifth, and we'll get to the fourth in a minute, and then reside in the sixth principle. And, and so that, that, that little capsule is the seventh and the sixth with this merged portions of, of the fourth and the fifth. Okay. HPB refers to the same thing as, quote, the most spiritual, i.e. the highest and divinest aspirations, not of the fifth principle per se, but of every personality. She, that's her word. She adds, specific, speaking specifically of the higher attributes of the fifth principle, that, quote, the noblest higher feelings, such as undying love, goodness, and all the attributes of divinity in man, even in their latent state, are drawn by affinity toward, follow, and merge into the monad, thus endowing it with a personal self-consciousness." End quote. Even Ananda Kumaraswamy, most of whose <coughs> writings on transmigration employed the exegetic method, observed that, quote, we shall not have taken with us to a new rebirth any of the psycho physical apparatus in which a sensitive memory could inhere. Only the intellectual virtues survive." End quote. Descriptions provided by the adepts in HPB regarding this nebulous following or merging or assimilation of elements or essences of the fifth principle into the sixth principle in Kamaloka describe aspects of the manas or mind of the decedent as noted above, that qualify for survival and rebirth. There is, however, yet another element or essence to consider in this process of merging or following or assimilation. Understood as feelings or emotions by initiates of the order of which the adepts are members, love and hatred are described by Kutumi as, quote, immortal feelings, end quote and as such appear to be an exception to the rule that all those components comprising the fourth of the seven principles of the human being, the kama rupa or the seat of emotion, disintegrate at some point after death. With regard to the events of the post-mortem transition, neither Moria nor Kutumi provide any detail about an exception for the emotions of love and hatred becoming part of the spiritual spoil that survives the postmortem states as a component of the transmigrant. KH does explain, though, that no other feelings in the bliss of Devashan exist, quote, quote, outside that immortal feeling of love and sympathetic attraction whose seeds 
are planted in the fifth principle, whose plants blossom luxuriously in and, in and around the fourth principle, but whose roots have to penetrate deep into the sixth principle." End quote. The higher fifth Manasarupa and the buddhi and the sixth buddhi principles are the, quote, spiritual faculties to which he refers. Kutumi notes that, quote, out of the resurrected past or prior incarnation, nothing remains but what the ego has felt spiritually that was evolved by and through and lived over by his spiritual faculties, be they love or hatred. End quote. It is significant that Kutumi use, uses the verb felt to explain the resurrection of love in the postmortem state of Devashan and potentially in subsequent incarnations, in contrast to exclusively fifth principle intellectual aspirations or recollections of a person's prior spiritual milestones. One could argue that love whose seeds, as K.H. states, are planted in the fifth principle, does not constitute an exception to the process that the sixth principle, or buddhi, may not assimilate sublimated spiritual essences or spoil arising from the fourth principle, the, kam the kamasic principle. Any such argument, however, must be left for another day, together with any investigation as to whether or how the sixth principle could possibly assimilate spoil from the immortal feelings of hatred, a subject well beyond the scope of this presentation. It should be without argument, however, that based on what we are provided in terms of spiritual science regarding the transmigrant and its transition through the postmortem states by the adepts in HBB, that first, the transmigrant consists primarily of the seventh and sixth principles, the Atman Buddhi. And second, the transmigrant also contains other sublimated elements or essences, some being distillations of life lessons, though most being our highest spiritual aspirations and the impersonal love and compassion that we exhibited during our incarnate lives. No name is given to these assimilated elements or essences by the adepts or HPB. But H.P. Me noted, in addition to containing uh, what already has been described about them, that they also provide a self-conscious awareness of the individuality of the transmigrant, which, which is lacking in the seventh and sixth principles. This is a crucial point. I'll let me repeat that. These whatever is merged into the sixth and seventh principle provide a self-conscious awareness of the individuality of the transmigrant, which is lacking in the seventh and sixth principles. By themselves, the sixth and seventh principles, have no, they're, while they're conscious and maybe even supreme consciousness, they have no self-consciousness. They have no recollection of anything. Only the, the distillation of the past memories and, and feelings, are the, are the, that's the thing that gives that monad or transmigrant the ability to be self-aware, in other words. They would also contain a supernal ledger of sorts of the karma from prior incarnations to which the transmigrant is subject. We thus have a transmigrant composed of the sixth and seventh principle, plus some surviving essences integrated into the higher fifth principle, or manasarupa, that follows or assimilated into the sixth principle. When this whole, when this triad of whole and partial surviving principles <coughs> is fully synthesized, it provides both self-consciousness and a preferred destination or course for the transmigrant to navigate in its succeeding incarnation. So finally, we come to the conclusion and definition of the transmigrant. In the last decades of the 19th century, which struck a catalytic hour on the clock of periodicity, specific and detailed truths of the transmigrant and its postmortem transition 
and many other truths were disclosed to the world in multiple publications, many of which had their genesis in the theosophical corpus of HBB and the letters of the adepts from the 1880s. The aggregation of all such medical, metaphysical specifics and details are what we have referred to here as spiritual science. Their conscious release to the wider public was not accidental, but rather providential. As Kutumi wrote to his chela, Francisca Arendale, in 1884, quote, think you truth has been shown to you for your sole advantage? That we have broken the silence of centuries for the profit of a handful of dreamers only? End quote. The silence broken can refer not only to unprecedented interaction with non-initiates by certain adepts between 1875 and 1885, but also to the content of their written exchanges, which shed considerable light on all aspects of spiritual science and the rigorous higher path of spiritual development toward initiation. Moreover, the written record shows that it was not alone for the profit of a handful of dreamers that this silence was broken, but for all of humanity. Within the brief historical and doctrinal context of the Philosophia Perennis since the late 1870s, as outlined, together with significant revelations of much spiritual science to the wider public during that time, we now come to the task posed by the question on our title, developing an answer to precisely what reincarnates. Based on our discussion above regarding the seven principles of human beings, we learned that these seven principles are commonly divided as the higher three or higher triad and the lower four or lower quaternary. The last principle of the higher triad, being the fifth principle, or manas, is further subdivided into two portions, the manas, uh, manas rupa and the manas arupa, lower and higher. We also learned that little to nothing of the ordinary mind, the manas rupa, reincarnates but rather eventually disintegrates along with the first, second, third, and fourth principles in the process of post-mortem transition. Conversely, either some portions or most of the manasa arupa, together with certain purified essences or distillations from prior incarnations, join the sixth principle, or buddhi, and collectively these with the seventh, or atma, comprise the reincarnating entity or transmigrant. It might therefore be more accurate to view the higher and lower division of the seven principles as between the lower four and a half and the higher two and a half. But as tempting as it may be to codify the transmigrant simply by a four and a half to two and a half division of the seven principles, it is not so simple. The most difficult, the most inscrutable, and least described aspect of the transmigrant in the literature of spiritual science, here being the writings of the adepts in HPB, is this aggregation of sublimated essences or distillations of, one previous, of one's previous incarnations arising from the fourth and fifth principles, which then join or follow the sixth principle. We have seen what both KH, Kutumi, and HPB stated about this arcane process, that, that what of the decedent's intellect joins or follows the buddhi in the postmortem states are the quintessence of good, nobler affections, saintly aspirations, spiritual spoil, most spiritualized portions, highest and divinest aspirations, and all the attributes of divinity in man. Those are the way that these essences are described in, in the writings of, the, of these, in the writings of these writers. There is, in addition, the matter of specific feelings arising in the fourth principle, the feelings of love and hatred, to use the words of Kutumi. By virtue of being immortal, at least to the point of liberation, these feelings, or at least that of love, must also necessarily survive the post-mortem transition and join the buddhi as an integral part of the reincarnating entity, the transmigrant. As I said, no word or term was used by the adepts or HPB to describe either this process 
or this bundle of spiritual attributes or essences arising from the fourth and fifth principles to permanently join the sixth principle or buddhi. But it comprises nonetheless part of the transmigrant and must therefore be included in any clear definition of it. Narrowing in on this definition, we begin with what is certain and clear. The immortal, sixth the immortal seventh principle, Atma, together with its carrier, the sixth principle, Buddhi, which both overshadow the incarnate person but are never within him or her, are the two basic and constant principles that comprise the transmigrant. We then add to these two principles all or some part of the higher fifth principle or mind, the Manasarupa, which is added by adjoining with the Buddhi. This, this fifth composite principle, so assimilated or joined to Atma Buddhi, contains within it the most spiritual and divine portions of the combined manas, together with only impersonal and unconditional love as a feeling or emotion arising from the fourth principle. Within these conjoined essences are further characteristics of self-conscious awareness and a record of past incarnations which, when merged or assimilated into the buddhi, supports HBB's notion cited above that, quote, man's spirit, while not individual per se, yet perseveres its distinct individuality in paranirvana, end quote. We believe it is the highest, it is these highest spiritual essences from the fourth and fifth principles merged into the sixth principle that allows this distinct individuality until the point of liberation from the wheel of death and rebirth is achieved, after which only Atma remains. If then we were to ascribe a term to that part of the transmigrant that was neither the sixth nor seventh, we might use sublimated spiritual essences. Now that's what I came up with as a term arising from the fourth and fifth principles. But one must take care in formulating such a definition not to suggest that any mundane or ordinary portion or segment of the fourth or fifth principles, unrefined and non-spiritual, survives to join the buddhi as part of the transmigrant. Based on all the foregoing then, we believe that in terms of the spiritual science, the transmigrant may be defined as follows. This is, and in the book, this is in bold print, so you can read it there. The overshadowing and immortal seventh principle, or Atma, within its carrier, the sixth principle, or Buddhi, joined through the, la the latter by a portion of the higher fifth principle containing certain sublimated, sublimated spiritual essences arising from the fourth and fifth principles. So that's as, that's as good as I could achieve in coming up with as a succinct a definition of what is actually the, the transmigrant. It is mostly by virtue of the differing spiritual essences of human beings that each, transmigra each transmigrant differs. They're all individuals still, even in that state. Oneness lies only in atma. The individual transmigrant retains self-conscious awareness and recollection throughout its reincarnations until it achieves liberation as a jivan mukti, after which no principles will remain after death and dissolution except the one non-human seventh principle, atma. It should be noted, though, that this eventual outcome will differ for those few who consciously elect to def defer nirvana to follow the bodhisattva path but that is another topic for a different venue. This transmigrant just described then is more precisely what of the human being that reincarnates, or at least as precise as the extant writings of HPB, the adepts, and others indicate. It is a matter of science, albeit occult or spiritual science, and not that of modern science based in the empir <coughs> empirical world and quantitative methods of physical sensation. It would nonetheless be refreshing to witness a cultural turn from the exclusively empirical methods of modernity toward a more spiritual understanding of why people are the way they are in daily life. 
Modern psychology has long been subject to dueling perspectives and the variant progeny of these dueling perspectives in the approach to this question. Those of sociobiology, seeking to explain most human behavior by means of DNA, heredity, and the genetic code, and those of environment, seeking to explain most human behavior by means of various conditions of youth, income, family, education, and so, for, and so forth. Not only should these two theoretical and often competing theses in the field of human behavior not be seen as mutually exclusive, they should operate together while adding another powerfully influential factor as to why people are the way they are, reincarnation based on spiritual science. If each incarnate person were to be evaluated equally by th these three methods, combined socio sociobiology, environment, and rebirth, arguably one might arrive at a far more comprehensive and accurate evaluation of the individual in question. It would also comport perfectly with HPB's observation that, quote, pre-existing or innate virtues talents or gifts are regarded as having been acquired in a previous birth. Genius is without exception a talent or aptitude brought from another birth. Thank you.